Hi, my name is Dr. Pamela Coons, and I'm a GI medical oncologist at Yale Cancer Center. And it is my pleasure to speak to you today, and I really appreciate the introduction. I also serve as the director of the Center for GI Cancers, and I'm the current president of the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. And I will be speaking today on the latest in net systemic treatments and considerations for treatment sequencing. These are my disclosures. And um, during today's discussion, I will go over current systemic treatment options. Given that you have already heard about clinical trials and PRRT, I will not go over these in detail, but may mention them as they relate to systemic treatments. I'll talk about select trials to watch in the systemic treatment space, tailoring treatment to the patient, and optimal sequencing of treatments. Um, I do want to mention that having just recently come off of the ASCO annual meeting, our American Society of Clinical Oncology, the theme of that meeting was partnering with patients. So I want you to know that really all of the oncologists are thinking about how to best partner with patients and anchor patients in really everything that we do. We'll also talk about optimal sequencing of treatments and then I have indicated with a gold star some areas of hot topics. So I really love to start with this slide. Some of you may have seen this before, but I think it is such an indication of what progress we have made. You will see that in the last 15 to 20 years, we have had an explosion of research, both in the treatment and the diagnosis of NETS. So below that timeline are examples of all of our FDA approvals for treatments for NETS, and above the timeline are examples of some of our new diagnostic imaging modalities. So I want this to be a sign of hope for the field. We are continuing to see this trajectory, and I um, remain hopeful about clinical research and new treatments becoming available. So net systemic treatments really fall into four big categories. These are really in the areas of PRRT, that's ludotatate, I will not focus on that, somatostatin analogs that include octreotide, LAR, and lanreotide, targeted therapies, including everolimus and sunitinib for PNET, and cytotoxic chemotherapies, and we'll touch on each of these areas. So I'll remind, though this data is not new, I think it's really an important foundation because it really serves as an important treatment for patients with NET. So somatostatin analogs for tumor control, and that's what we're gonna focus on, not on hormone control. Those, um, our use of these are really based on two key clinical trials, the PROMID trial and the Clarinet trial. So the PROMID trial was a trial of octreotide versus placebo in mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. It demonstrated more efficacy, so a longer time to progress for octreotide versus the placebo. That was one of our first indications that somatostatin analogs slowed the progression of these tumors. The clarinet study is a more recently conducted study and was lanreotide versus placebo in GEPnet, so it was a broader patient population that included pancreatic nets in addition to midgut. And that also showed prolongation of the progression-free survival, so it took longer for patients to progress on lanreotide compared to placebo. And really about on average, when sort of we looked at kind of a later stage of the study called the open-label extension phase, it took patients about three years or a little over three years until they had progression. You will get used to seeing some of these survival curves. This is how clinical researchers look at and define success or efficacy of treatments on clinical trials below. And you've probably had some of this teaching in uh, the presentation on clinical trials, but the horizontal axis is months. The vertical axis are the patients with progression-free survival. The lanreotide arm is red above, kind of the higher the arm, the better, and the placebo arm is in blue. I also, when I'm talking about net treatments, like to talk about responses. So that means, do we see any evidence of shrinkage from these treatments? And stability is still a win for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, particularly the grade one and two well-differentiated nets. So somatostatin analogs generally yield stability. We usually do not see shrinkage or a response. That RR means response rate. So these at best generally stabilize growth. And um, again, that is still a really important treatment outcome or response outcome. 
Side effects from somatostatin analogs include nausea, diarrhea, gallstone formation, that's cholelithiasis and elevated glucose. And lanreotide was FDA approved for tumor control in 2014 on the basis of this clarinet study. So another targeted therapy is called everolimus, and you will see my little target sign there. So it targets a specific tumor growth pathway called the mTOR pathway. Everolimus um, has been studied in a whole series of trials called the RADIANT trials, RADIANT 1, 2, 3, and 4. I've only listed here RADIANT 3 and 4 because they are really the key studies. So RADIANT 3 was Everolimus versus placebo in pancreatic nets. It was a large study. It demonstrated that Everolimus was more efficacious than placebo. It prolonged progression-free survival. The RADIANT 4 study showed something very similar, but in a different population in GI and lung nets. So it also demonstrated prolongation of progression-free survival. Like on the last slide, I want to look at, well, does this agent, does Everolimus shrink nets? Um, in general, the answer is no. It usually also leads to stability. Um, and the response rate or shrinkage rate is between 2 to 5% of patients had a significant amount of shrinkage. The side effects, and you'll see I've also given everyone some little clues. So that graph figure refers to when I talk about the responses, and the pill bottle figure refers to when I'm talking about side effects. So the side effects for Everolimus are more than what we see for somatostatin analogs. They include fatigue, stomatitis or mouth sores, um, rash, and diarrhea. So on the basis of this series of radiant trials, we see that Everolimus was FDA approved for lung, pancreatic, and GI nets in 2011. The third form of targeted therapy is sunitinib. Um, this targets a series of genes that are really responsible for blood vessels or, um, and VEGF stands for the vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, that's one of the key targets. And so the SUN111 trial was the trial that studied sunitinib in pancreatic nets. Like the others, it demonstrated effectiveness of sunitinib more so than placebo on the basis of prolonging progression-free survival. So again, mostly yield stability. The response rate was about 9%. So the shrinkage rate was a little bit more than what we saw for somatostatin analogs and what we saw for alvarolimus. But in general, we mostly see stability. Side effects include fatigue, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and hypertension or high blood pressure. That's something we see um, with these agents that affect blood vessels. And the researchers in this trial also looked at patient quality of life, and there was no difference between the two arms. You will see that as we have more modern trials coming out, quality of life as a component to, out to evaluate is actually very important. And another big takeaway from our ASCO annual meeting is that we are starting to ask patients to report back their quality of life directly and to report back the symptoms. Those are called patient reported outcomes and that's a critical way to better assess um, in real time how patients are feeling rather than the researchers grading these side effects. So sunitinib was FDA approved for pancreatic nets also in 2011. So moving on to chemotherapy, CAPTEM or capecitamine temozolomide is used um, quite a bit in pancreatic nets. This was a study I had the fortune of being able to lead nationally. This was sponsored by our National Cancer Institutes. And we studied over 140 patients. Half of them got temozolomide alone, half received capecitabine temozolomide, and the combination arm did better. So we saw in the red line here on the right that the combination of capecitabine and temozolomide had a median progression-free survival of close to two years. So that it meant patients who received that treatment, it took about two years for us to see progression. What's critically important about this trial under response outcome is this is one of our best combinations to shrink the cancer. So unlike the other agents that I've just talked about, we actually see a 30 to 40% response rate. Temozolomide alone yields about a 34% response rate, and the combination yields about a 40% response rate. So for patients who have larger or bulkier tumors or symptoms that we think are from the size of the tumor and we objectively need to shrink, this is a good option for patients with pancreatic nets.
I put a little gold star on this because we are starting to evaluate biomarkers. So MGMT stands for methylguanine methyltransferase and is a tissue-based marker that if it is low, we now know from this trial that it is associated with response. We still have more work to do to really define this um, more clearly, but it's really exciting. We're trying to get more biomarkers that tell us which patients respond and which patients do not. Captem has some side effects. It can lower blood counts. That's the cytopenias. It can cause fatigue, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and some a rash on the hands and feet that's a dryness of the hands and feet or peeling called hand foot syndrome. Not everybody gets all of these side effects, but it's important. And when I'm describing this to patients, we try to review all of the common side effects. So um, I'm gonna move on to talk just about a couple of key trials I want everyone to be aware of. So systemic treatment trials to watch. I'm really gonna focus on these targeted agents or chemotherapies, the A021602. This is a randomized clinical trial being led by Dr. Jennifer Chan. It's another NCI, National Cancer Institute sponsored trial. It's for patients with pancreatic nets and GI nets and lung nets. And it's cabazantinib versus placebo. This is the cabinet trial. It's actually nearing the end of accrual, which we're really excited about. So cabazantinib is another medicine. It kind of sounds like sunitinib. So the key is that any of these agents that end in IB are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And this also targets that blood vessel pathway. SWOG or S2104 is led by doctors Suarez and Ahmad. It's really our first study to look at does post-operative treatment help reduce the risk of recurrence. So this is for patients who have resected well-differentiated pancreatic nets who are at high risk of recurrence and we randomize them to receive CAPTEM for four months versus observation. Observation is currently the standard of care. We don't have evidence to support the use of post-operative treatment like we do in other cancers like colon cancer. So this will be a critically important trial to define the role. And because we know that CAPTEM works in the metastatic setting, we are bringing it earlier into that post-operative setting. What I'm excited to see is some new research in neuroendocrine carcinomas. As you know from some of the earlier talks, these are the higher grade or a more aggressive form of neuroendocrine um, neoplasm. This is being led by doctors Zen and Chiorian, another NCI National Cancer Institute sponsored trial. And this is looking at advanced, poorly differentiated extra pulmonary, smaller, large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas, and is looking at the question of can we combine chemotherapy with immunotherapy? And this is borrowed from the small cell lung cancer data. So atezolizumab is one of these checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapies. And it's sort of three different arms of looking at the combinations of chemotherapy, so atopicide and platinum, plus a TESO followed by a TESO maintenance, a topicide platinum plus a TESO followed by observation, and a topicide platinum followed by observation. So really exciting that we're starting to see some novel research in neuroendocrine carcinoma. So we have, in the last six months, had two of our really important professional society meetings. So GI23 is GI ASCO. That happens in January of every year. And it's um, our professional society meetings are ways that as scientists and clinical researchers, we share new trials. This is a trial in progress. So we don't have data yet, but I was excited to share this with you to demonstrate that we're looking at new oncolytic viruses, vesicular stomatitis virus, with immunotherapy, with pembrolizumab in patients with neuroendocrine carcinoma. So I know many of you know and have heard that single agent pembrolizumab and some of these immunotherapies have not historically worked in neuroendocrine neoplasms, but we're trying to figure out novel ways of combining different immunotherapy approaches. So in this case, it's a oncolytic virus plus an immunotherapy. So I'm excited to see uh, eventually the results of this trial. So again, we don't have results, but excited to know that this is ongoing. Literally just a few days ago, I returned from ASCO 23. So the American Society of Clinical Oncology is a professional society meeting of 46,000 oncologists. And again, a great place to share um, information. So I wanted to highlight three abstracts here. 
The first one is looking at imaging. So this is not a treatment trial, but it's this idea that for certain patients using both types of PETs, so an FDG PET scan and a Gallium 68 Dota Talk PET scan, that sometimes using both of those for patients with GEPNENs can actually be really helpful to determine and tailor therapies and predict biology. So that's the takeaway from that one. Abstract 4133 was led by Dr. Nina Vijay Vergia, and um, she and I partnered on this. She actually took the images from that CAPTEM trial, the ECOG 2211 trial, and really tried to learn a lot about the images. So this was one of the first studies that actually banked images on all 144 patients. So it's really critically important that we do that on our net trials to learn more. And what we learned from this is that the current way that we evaluate neuroendocrine tumor images in clinical trials is probably not optimal and we maybe need to be using alternative criteria. Also kind of the beginning of a story here, but something that we will certainly do more research on. And then abstract 4135 is looking at genetic changes. So inherited genetic changes, those are called germline DNA or germline mutations are really critically important in patients with pancreatic nets. We can see upwards of 21% of patients having germline DNA changes. Therefore, we really need to be testing and having our patients with pancreatic nets see cancer genetics, see a genetics counselor, and consider testing. So I'll, I'll mention that germline DNA is different than the DNA of the cancer. And we often will look at both, but I just wanna highlight the fact that those are different. So getting to thinking about, well, how do we make choices of these systemic treatments? So on the left, you can see an excerpt from our NCCN guidelines. That's the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. This is a go-to resource for all oncologists. I'm sure many of the experts that have talked with you today, some of them are on this panel that helps determine these guidelines. So for GEPNETs, the first line therapy for most is, are these somatostatin analogs. Second line can include Averolimus, Sunitinib, Captem, Ludotate, liver-directed therapies. We don't know the optimal sequence, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we as doctors help make those determinations. On the right, you see neurotoxin carcinomas. The first line is generally platinum etoposide. The second line can include a number of other chemotherapies. And as I'd mentioned, this is also an active area of research to determine if we can add immunotherapy to that. So critical in selecting treatments is tailoring treatment to the patient. As I'd mentioned earlier, partnering with patients, looking at characteristics of patients, whether they be characteristics of the tumor, individual characteristics of the patient, such as sex, gender, and race, and characteristics of their environment that include social determinants of health, like where you live and do you have access to treatment and do you have access to rides to get to the doctor? All of these things impact care. So I'm gonna give you an example. So um, I recently saw a 60-year-old patient with a non-functional, so it did not secrete hormones, metastatic, well-differentiated grade two net of the pancreas. The picture on the right is a picture of the Gallium 68 PET scan that patient had done, so had a number of liver lesions. So we would consider those high volume or bulky liver lesions. And it, obviously because of the Gallium PET, that was, they were somatostatin receptor positive. There were no germline mutations, so no inherited risk, and no genetic mutations in the tumor itself. So now that I have this information, how do I select the next treatment? So optimizing sequencing of treatments really is this balancing act between thinking about treatment outcomes, as I'd mentioned in all of those trials, we think and ask ourselves, do these treatments stabilize the cancer or do they shrink the cancer? And we also think about side effects. Are they minimal or do they have more moderate side effects? And we often try to start with treatments. We wish all of our treatments had minimal to no side effects. I, when I talk to my patients, I say that if it hits that sweet spot of minimal side effects but is effective, that would really be the ideal for all of our treatments. But we do have to think about side effects. And each of our therapies, so PRT, somatostatin analogs, targeted therapies, and cytotoxic chemotherapies have different responses, 
and have different levels of tolerability. And so for that patient that I just mentioned, the patient's otherwise pretty healthy, the patient has larger liver lesions, they are having some abdominal pain, I would probably choose cytotoxic chemotherapy with CAPTEM for that patient with the pancreatic net in effort to try to shrink those liver lesions because it has the best chance of response, as you can see, over on that the far right side where we have the best responses from cytotoxic chemotherapy. And we will go through that algorithm as we think about patients that are in front of us and how we can best meet their needs, but also minimize toxicity. So key take home points um, that I hope you've really learned through the course of these lectures is that nets are really not that rare. They're deserving of high quality basic translational and clinical research. I'm excited that the field has really come so far in the last 15 or so years, and I'm very optimistic about the future. We have many tools, including tyrosine kinase inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors, chemotherapies, PRRT, liver-directed therapies, and really, through what you've heard today about clinical trials, I'm very optimistic about future advances. Though it was not my job to talk about PRT, I do want to really just call out that PRT is a game changer. We hope to optimize its use through better patient selection, decreasing toxicities, and increasing efficacy. And I'd like to really end on anchoring this conversation in tailoring treatment for every patient. I think it really requires a careful balance of patient characteristics, treatment characteristics, having an informed discussion with your physicians. So I am going to end here. Um, really, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today.